Um, in our last three teachings, we talked about God's covenant with Israel. We had a couple of teachings about those covenant, that covenant being the covenants being the covenants of faith. Um, and then we talked about God's chosen possession or God's special possession, Israel. And tonight, I just want to continue some thoughts from that three-part series, if you will. And I made a statement in one of those teachings, and maybe a couple of times, I said one of the reasons why it's so important for us to understand, to have a biblical understanding of the covenant, or the new covenant, the covenant of God given through Moses at Mount Sinai, is because when we understand that covenant in its proper context, when we understand God's relationship is with Israel in its proper context, then so many more things, if not everything else in the Scripture, begin to make sense. And you can read little phrases here and there in the Scriptures and say, ah, now I know what that means. That will happen to you if you have a firm grasp on uh, God's covenant with Israel. And so um, I hope it was also made clear that all covenants between God and man were covenants based on faith. There was never, there has never been, and no one has ever been in right relationship with Yahweh outside of faith. It just wasn't, it's just not possible. And I really feel that it's important for uh, believers everywhere to understand these covenants in their biblical context because it is the foundation on which a genuine faith in Christ the Messiah is built. My prayer I pray this regularly is that believers and churchgoers everywhere will come to know the miracle of coming to faith. I call it, I, I, when, I, when I talk about being born again or coming to a genuine faith, I call it a miraculous transi- transaction that has taken place. And that's not by accident. There's reason why I call it a miraculous transaction. Uh, it's a miraculous transaction that takes place in the life of someone who has truly been born again, that 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 has experienced the miracle of new birth. Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 1, and he he prayed that for the saints of Ephesus, he said, I pray that the eyes of our understanding or your understanding would become flooded with light so that you would know the hope to which you've been called. And so, the miraculous transac- transaction that I speak of, the hope to which you've been called that Paul is describing, involves much more than being raised from death to life. Being born again involves much more than being raised from death to life. It involves much more than being translated from darkness to light. It means much more than just having eternal life. And so I want to talk uh, about some of the, a couple of those things tonight for a few minutes. I've said a few times from this pulpit that we have a serious problem, or a, we can call it an epidemic in the modern day church. And the epidemic that I speak of is the epidemic of false conversions. Multitudes of people who attend church on a weekly basis have been told that they've been born again, and the proof of their salvation rests in the fact that they prayed a prayer. That's what people being that's what people are being told. That's the proof of your salvation. Because the Bible says, if you confess with your heart, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. And that's a, that's a truth. But many people believe that they are born again simply by a confession that they repeated after some preacher or teacher. And I want you to know that there is proof. You can have proof that you've been born again. The proof of your conversion does not rest solely on the fact that you said a prayer. The proof of your conversion is whether or not you have a desire to live in such a way that pleases God. 
The proof of your conversion is found in the fact that you hate sin. How many of you hate sin? I despise it. And I can't stand it when I, when I do it. It grieves me. So that's, that's proof that there's been a change in your heart. You hate sin and you're sickened by your own sin and you're quick to repent when, you're re when you realize you're guilty of it. The proof of your conversion is found in the fact that you now have a hunger for godliness rather than a hunger to do what pleases yourself or those who you associate with. We all need to know what happens in the new birth. We need to know what happens when that, that spiritual transaction takes place or that miraculous transaction takes place. I want you to know that there is more than just knowing that you've been forgiven of your sins. There's more to this faith than just knowing that you have been forgiven of your sins. So not only does Paul pray that God's people would know the hope to which they have been called, but he describes our salvation uh, or our new birth as walking in newness of life. Walking in newness of life. And if I were to title this teaching tonight, it would be that. What is this walking in newness of life? What is that about? So let's read from Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 3 and verse 4. Paul writes and he says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life so that we too might walk in newness of life. He says very clearly that we were buried with him by baptism in order that we too might walk in newness of life. So that's where I got the question from. What is this newness of life? There are multitudes of scriptures that talk about this newness of life. We're only going to quote a couple of them. And the next one I want to read uh, where Paul writes about this new life is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So in Romans, he calls it walking in newness of life. To the church of Corinth, he describes it as being a new creation, the old passing away, and the new has come. Well, what is this new that has come? As I said, I've only presented you with two passages of Scripture. There are many more. But the question is, what is this newness of life? What does it look like? And how can we articulate just what this new newness of life means? You know, we live in a, in a church age where most theology or most people's theology is as deep as a one-liner in a meme or some self-help kind of quote. That's about the depth of most people's theology. And so I've heard throughout my Christian walk that we were born again so that we might walk in newness of life. How many of you heard that we live by the Spirit, not by the flesh. Well, what does that mean? How do you articulate that? What does it look like? Where's the instructions on how to accomplish that? See, Bible theology is more than just a charismatic phrase. It's life-changing truth. And we have to dig in sometimes, most times, to understand what that truth is. So we can start to get a better understanding of what Paul means by what this newness of life is by reading how he tells us how we should not be living, right? 
We'll do that in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. So we're going to talk about what this newness of life is. And we're going to start by looking at what it is not. What it is not. He says in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. And listen how he describes them. Verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So Paul is instructing Christians, those that are of the faith at Ephesus, that they should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. Now, remember in last week's teaching, we, we told you what Gentiles are, who Gentiles are. They're, they're all the nations that are not Israel. They're the heathen. They're the nations. They're, the Hebrew word is goy. And Paul says, don't live as they live. Don't walk as they walk. In the futility of their minds, their understanding is darkened. They're alienated from the life of God. Why? Because of the ignorance that is in them. And then listen to this. Due to their hardness of heart. So not, don't walk as the Gentiles do. We could also use the word nations. They walk in the futility of their minds, which are darkened in their understanding, and they are alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. And I think that's an important phrase to remember. Uh, He says they walk this way due to their hardness of heart. And he goes on later in the chapter, and he exhorts the saints in this way, Ephesians 4, chapter, chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. He says, now, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So now we begin getting some understanding of what this new newness of life is about. It's not about walking like the Gentiles walk or living as the Gentiles walk, but he says, when you put on your new self, you need to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on your new self because your new self was created after the likeness of God. So how do we walk in this newness of life? Well, we need to understand the likeness of God and we need to understand what is righteousness and holiness. Where do we get that understanding from? Does it come from osmosis? I mean, where does it come from? Do you just gain it over time if you church, if you attend church on a week, weekly basis? Well, I hope so. But that's not the way it happens necessarily. To answer the question of what does it mean to walk in newness of life, we know that we need to walk differently than the Gentiles walk. And so there's a different standard that defines this newness of life, right? There's something that defines it. What is it? What is it that defines this newness of life? We, we ask the question, how do we articulate how we walk in this newness of life? Well, there's a standard that defines it. And it's this covenant that God has with his people. We can call it the new covenant. We can call it the covenant of Moses. We can call it the, the covenant that God gave to Israel through Moses. We, we call it the Torah. We can call it walking as Christ walked because he was the Torah made flesh. There's all kinds of ways we can, we can understand what this newness of life is. So if you remember from our teaching last week, I said that we need to answer the question of who is Israel. Because when we understand what walking in newness of life is, we have the answer to the question, who is Israel? It's the same thing. Amen? Do you agree with that? Do you see how that 
is just yet? Who is Israel, biblically speaking? The covenants of faith were given to God's special possession, Israel. Walking in newness of life means walking the way God has instructed his special possession to walk. That's walking in newness of life. Now, Paul says something very similar, very similar to our text from Romans 6 when he writes his letter to the Galatians. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 through 29. This is what he says. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, there he uses that phrase again. He uses that several times in his writing. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So see how I tie this walking in newness of life to being the same as God's special possession, Israel? He said, if you are baptized into Christ and have put on Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. Well, who's Abraham's offspring? Israel. The children of Abraham those who are of faith, and heirs according to the promise. So, so far in all the scriptures that we have shared to this point, we can say the following is true for all who have been buried with Christ or who are in Christ or who have put on Christ. From Romans 6, he says, we have been buried with him so that we can walk in newness of life. From 2 Corinthians 5, he says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation From Ephesians chapter 4, he tells us that in Christ we should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk, but to put on our new self, which is created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And finally, in Galatians 3, he tells us that if we are Christ's, then we are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. Heirs according to the promise. So we want to understand what walking is in newness of life. Now I am purposefully, I am purposefully taking the long road, if you will, on how to answer that question. And it's a road probably that most people would not take in answering that question. I like taking a different route to get to the answer. I've done that. I practice that actually when I teach. I want you to see that walking in newness of life encompasses much more than we might think. So, what does it mean to be Abraham's offspring and heir according to the promise? What does that mean? Heir to what promise? What what promise was given to Abraham? Well, let's look at that. And we'll do that just briefly here. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. So if we are in Christ, we are children of Abraham. We're heirs according to the promise. This promise that God is giving Abraham is this, I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now I didn't write them down for this particular message but you remember the five divine promises that were given to us in the covenant, in the new covenant, in the covenant of God given at Mount Sinai? One of those promises, I think it was number five, was that our enemies would be enemies of God and that God would protect his people. Well, this is where that comes from. God is telling Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and, I, and those who dishonor you I will curse 
and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So this is a powerful promise to Abraham, to be a friend of God, to have God bl blessing those who bless us and those who dishonors us, God curses. And God choosing to bless us in such a way that all the families of the earth are blessed. That's what it means to be an heir. That's the promise given to Abraham. And we are heirs according to that promise. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. Thank you. <laughs> it's a powerful promise. And what is the blessing that all the families of the earth will be blessed with? What is that blessing? Have you ever wondered what it might be? The Scriptures gives us details, and I've mentioned it. It's the same blessings that I've mentioned in previous teachings uh, recently, but there's more to it. The Scripture gives us details of this blessing, but I want to give you a summation of, if I were to give you a summation of what this blessing is, I would refer you to, refer you to Revelations chapter 7, verse 9. And this is what John writes. He says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And John goes on to say, these are they that came out of great tribulation. But what John sees here, what John the revelator sees here is this great multitude of people from every nation, every tribe and tongue standing before the throne of God. Again, like, like I said, you can read more about them in, in the rest of the verses. 10 through 17 of the same chapter when you have time. So in short, the blessing or promise of God given to Abraham way back in Genesis 12 has come to pass in John's vision in Revelation chapter 7. There are multitudes of people clothed in white standing before the throne of God. These are the saints of God who have been redeemed from the earth. Those standing before the throne of God in white robes are the children of Abraham, otherwise known as Israel. And counted among Israel were people from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. They weren't necessarily natural born Israelites. Something happened and made them Israelite. Something happened. In other words, there was a miraculous transaction that took place in the life of some Gentile that made them a child of God. Do you know what that transaction was? New birth. Being born again. Coming to a genuine faith in Christ the Messiah. That's the transaction that took place. And that transaction took place for every one of these people standing before the throne of God clothed in white robes. People from every tribe, every nation, and every tongue. The children of Abraham. You remember what God told Abraham? Abraham looked to the stars. What did he tell them? If you can count the number of these stars, so shall the number of your seed be. That's what he told Abraham. Abraham was going to be used by God to bless the nations. I think that's pretty cool. If you are here tonight and have experienced the miracle of new birth, if you have come to a genuine faith in Christ the Messiah, yes, if you have been saved, I want you to know that you have become God's special possession. You have been saved for a specific purpose. I want you to know that you have been called out from among the nations for a reason. 
but I want you to most assuredly know that you are now called the Israel of God. That's who you are. You have been adopted into the family of God's special possession. That's who you are. The new covenant through which you have been saved is clear. All of us who have come to faith in Christ are now in covenant relationship. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture. We read it recently. I'm going to read it again, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes here, and he says about those people that have been saved or have been called out from the nations. He's describing them here in Ephesians chapter 2. And he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God. I love that conjunction. I love it when Paul uses that phrasing. He does it several times. But God, being rich in mercy, remember what he told Israel through Moses? I am a God God who is rich in mercy, forgiving your iniquity and sins. Amen? That's, what, that's, the, that's the same God that Paul's talking about here. But God, who is rich in mercy, still the same God, the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with and seated us. He made us alive together. I mean, I missed my place. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse seven, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, walking in newness of life. What does that mean? Well, we have some more understanding here. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So walking in newness of life involves good works. Good works that were prepared beforehand. Where do we find those good works? Come on, go ahead and answer. In God's Torah in the instructions that God gave Israel through Moses. That's where we find the details of what good works are. Those were the works that were prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. But now in Christ, but now in Christ, you Gentiles, you heathen, you aliens, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen. We were once separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants, but that is, not, that is not true of us anymore. If you've come to a genuine faith, if you've been born again, you are now brought into that commonwealth of Israel. You're no longer strangers to the covenants of promise. You are now considered the commonwealth of Israel. And that is a powerful blessing. It's a blessing to be in covenant relationship with our Heavenly Father, amen, with God. 
with the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It's a blessing to be considered members of the household of Israel, to be the offspring of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. I want to just ask, how many of you are thankful for that? I am. So, I want to spend a few minutes talking about this covenant relationship and showing what our covenant relationship is like and, and give a, more of an answer to what this newness of life is all about. We're going to read in Jeremiah chapter 31. And I'm going to read beginning in verse 31 because I want us to see that God is a merciful God. When Jeremiah writes about the new covenant, he clearly shows that God is a merciful God. In verse 31, he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them out, took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. I'm going to show you God's mercy more so when we get to Ezekiel, but this is Jeremiah's writing. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So remember last week when I said, or over the course of the last couple of teachings, I said that the old covenant and the new covenant were one and the same. And yes, the new covenant was made better, but it was made better because it went from a table of stone to a heart of flesh. That's how it was made better. And Jeremiah is confirming this. <clears throat> then Ezekiel gives us more detail about this covenant. In Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 21. And this is where Ezekiel is reminding Israel of God's mercy. He says, but I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they came. That's what he says. I had concern for my holy name. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you have come. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you... That's another way of God saying, I'm going to have mercy on you because through you, I'm going to vindicate the holiness of the holiness or my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you I will, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols, I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put, in, put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in newness of life. What did God, how did, how did Paul describe God's Torah? How did King David dis describe God's Torah? Didn't they both describe them uh, as life? said it was life. They said it was righteousness. It said it was good, right? They both use those words. Now here God is saying in this promise, this new covenant, he said, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk. I said newness of life, but here Ezekiel uses the words in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So that gives, us the, that gives us the confirmation and the understanding of, a, of what walking in newness of life is. When we come to saving faith, when we come to a genuine faith in Christ the Messiah, walking in newness of life by the Holy Spirit that is working in us is walking out obedience to his commandments and his statutes and his rules. Amen? Amen. That's how we walk in newness of life. That's how we walk in the Spirit, is by walking in obedience to God's instructions. You all act like you knew that already. The reality is you did. We're just articulating it. 
We're just laying it out there so that you can explain it to somebody else what walking the newness of life is, is all about. Amen? It, we want it to go from a Christian charismatic phrase to something that is that we can chew on, that we can eat, that we can digest, and, and it become a part of us. We want understanding. We want it to be Bible truth that we can articulate. So this passage of Scripture is certainly not new to us. I've referred to it and have read it time and time again over the past several months. And the reason I do that is because it puts our redemption and the purpose of our redemption in its proper context. If you have been saved, born again, and I'm going to repeat it, come to a genuine faith in the Messiah, it is to this end that you become God's special possession. And God's special possession, he speaks through the prophet Isaiah, he speaks through Moses, and he says, I have called you to me. I think he, through Isaiah, he uses the words as the as the loincloth clings to the waist of a man, I have caused Israel to cling to me so that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory. That's what walking in newness of life is all about. That's what your calling in this life is all about. Being a people of God for his glory. That's what walking in newness of life is all about. When Paul says that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's how we walk in newness of life. Walking in newness of life. And there's multiple ways we can say it. Again, scriptures that I haven't, put, that I haven't referenced tonight, but I'll reference real quick. John tells us that we should walk as the Messiah walks. Right? That's walking in newness of life. We need to walk as the Messiah walked. He was the Torah of God made flesh. And that's how we need to walk. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your spirit that speaks to us, that teaches us, that leads us and guides us into truth. And we pray, God, that we will be faithful in walking in this newness of life that you've called us to walk. Help us, God, to just grow in your word and understand in greater depth. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen.